Well, good morning. If you'd like to stand and worship with us, please do. If you want to sit down, you can do that. If you want to lie down, you can lie down too. Don't fall asleep though, okay? I'm just kidding. Well, good Good morning. Welcome to HMC, Hilo Missionary Church. We're going to just worship our Lord this morning first. First and foremost, I hope you're doing that in your own time, but we do it together now. strumming the wrong rhythm this is uh, in case you didn't know this is in six eight time one two three four five six sorry here we go you 
are the Lord. You are the Lord. The famous one, famous one, great is your name. Glorious, great is your family on earth. And for all you've done and yet to do, Praise God. He's famous. He shows himself. He's revealing himself all over the world, not just here in Hawaii. But we're so thankful that he is revealing himself here in Hawaii. 
to us. He is a great and awesome God. Thank you, Lord, that you are. There's no words to describe you, though we try in our worship. You are indescribable, uncontainable, awesome God. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, our struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. has told every lightning for where it should go or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow who imagine the sun and give source to its light yet conceals us to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, past up we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God. You are amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, our struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. Incomparable, unchangeable, you see the depth of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing.
Amen. Lord, we come to you. You are an awesome and faithful God. All-powerful, almighty, holy, and yet you choose to come and be with us. So just thank you so much. We worship you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray that this worship would be acceptable to you here and online, any, any place that your worship is being heard. Lord, please cause it to be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name. I was telling the worship team this morning, I went to a struggle having children. We thought we couldn't have our own. Kept praying. We had doubts and hurts, but we kept trying. I give credit to my wife because she had to go do all the work of it. And yet be disappointed when the baby was not alive. So when we got pregnant with our children, I would uh, cuddle up close to my wife and I'd sing along this song with them. The Lord was forming them. And they still love to hear it when uh, they're out. So I'd sing this with them as they come to bed. Because I think it's so important for us to remember this. You have a maker. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. Because he knew you before he formed you. I have a maker. He formed my heart before even time began. My life was your hand. Cause me his own 
He'll never leave No matter where I go He knows my name He knows my every thought He sees each tree that falls He knows my name He knows by every thought He sees each tear that falls And hears me when I call He hears me I call He hears me when I call I have a miracle Isn't that good news? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, greet one another. And uh, yeah, God is so good. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Happy week after Father's Day. Um, it's nice to see everyone again. Thank you, Ken, for the worship. I have a cheesy joke for you today. This one was not mine. It was shared with me during the week, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, there was a, yo uh, a young man. He was having a conversation with God, and he asked God, he says, God, is it true that a thousand years is like a minute for you? And God says, yes, it is true. And then he pauses for a second and he asks God, he says, well, I've also heard that like a million dollars is just like a penny to you. Is that true? And God says, yes, yes, that's true. And he says, well, God, I've been going through some financial difficulties. Would you be able to loan me a penny? And God said, yeah, sure, in a second. Uh, it's, it's a slow burn, you'll get there. Um, okay, I have a couple quick announcements. I'm just going to pull up my little cheat sheet here. So uh, going on this week, we have the Purple Book Bible Study. Purple Book Bible Study goes on Wednesdays here in the lounge. Uh, Caroline has been leading that. Uh, if I put you on the spot and asked about this week's topic, she's... Do you know, remember? No, no worries. Uh, but every week, it's a new topic as they're working wi their way through the biblical foundations of faith. So each uh, week is like the spiritual gifts. Who's the Holy Spirit? Uh, I know that you guys did that one just recently. What is sin? And they talk about that topic for the week. And then the next week, they move on to another one. Generally, sometimes it takes over. But anyways, if you are a new believer or you're a longtime believer that want to get a refresher on your faith, and this is a chance to come and fellowship, talk about the biblical truths that are pretty foundational, and uh, have some good time with Caroline and the other people that go. So that's Purple Book. Goes on Wednesday nights, 5.30, here in the lounge. Talk with Caroline. Caroline, give a wave so people know who you are. The other thing we have is, did I say your name enough, Caroline? Should I say it one more time? Caroline? Uh, just kidding. Uh, Youth Friday night. Uh, Ken's pointing her out. Um, Youth Friday night. Uh, this this week we're uh, here at the church. We're going to have games. We're going to have some food. It's going to be a fun time. That's from 6 to 8 o'clock. Come hang out with me and the kids. 
Youth Night Friday. Ignite the Night. That one's coming up on Friday, July 8th. Did I read that right? Yes. The worship part will be led by Wayne Santos, who is a great guitarist and musician. He's going to be doing the worship part, but that's not all it is. Ignite the Night is also a night for having a chance to come relax, be in his presence. If God gives you a word to share, if he gives you a Bible verse, if he gives you a word of encouragement, whatever it might be, that's your chance to be able to share and encourage the group. And we saturate it and cover it all with a good uh, time of worship as well. So it's a great time, Friday, July 8th, uh, 7 o'clock. The next uh, big one, this is a little ways away, but I was just going to start putting some uh, feelers out there for you so you guys know what's going on coming up, is Second Hand Saturday, not a garage sale, Second Hand Saturday, uh, the, sorry, I was just teasing because they said, call it Second Hand Saturday, not garage sale, and I put both, so there you go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so if you want to be a part of that, if you want to be a part of the garage sale. Um, you can uh, talk with Janella or Caroline. You can reserve a booth, and it's going to be in the parking lot here at the church in the back, and we're going to have a bunch of different uh, people and families, whoever wants to come, can set up their own parking space or 10 by 10 pop-up tent and sell, and then that'll be a good day to get rid of everything you've accumulated over quarantine and all that shopping sprees and online Amazon orders. Now you can finally uh, sell, sell a some of that stuff. August 13th, 7 to 12, talk with Caroline or Janella. And the last but not least coming up one is a craft fair. We have a craft fair. We haven't done this in almost two years, so this is a nice time to uh, come check out what people have been working on. The last one was, yeah, two years ago, or almost three. So this one's going to be November 5th. If you want to be a part or have a vendor booth at the craft fair, talk with, you guessed it, Janella. She's or helping organize that uh, for the craft fair, and yeah, so we'll keep the you on tabs for Second Hand Saturday and craft fair because those are a ways away. And that's all I got for announcements. Short, sweet. It only took one second. No, oh, it was a reference to earlier. It's okay. I know it's a groaner. It, it'll. It. Uh, but let's just pray, and I'm gonna invite up Brother Kent, who's gonna be sharing with us this morning. Heavenly Father. I just thank you in the name of Jesus that we get to be here worshiping your name publicly. Lord, may we take this time and make your name great. That people who drive by on the road or just even hear the, the sounds of the worship, Lord, that it would be making your name well known by our lives, by our words, by our actions, what we do. So Lord, I just ask that we would take this time to be encouraged that as we go back out into the world, and we just have this moment together that we would be refreshed. The problems that have encroached and taken over our lives this past week, we would take a moment to give them back to you and allow you to work in our lives and to work on these problems. You're far better at it than I am. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would be working. Give us uh, a moment here with Kent that you would anoint him, that uh, the words that you're placing on his heart to share would go to us, that they would be what we need to hear for each individual, and that, Lord, our faith would be strengthened this morning. I know he's talking about uh, apologetics and why we believe what we believe and the truth behind it, and so, Lord, may we be encouraged and we go out and share that with others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Oh, anybody here know what apologetics is? Right on. You know, it's not the thing that most of us talk about, um, but it should, I think it should be a thing that we learn about, especially in this day and age, because the enemy is just trying his, his hardest to um, make it so difficult for us to talk about our faith. In the in the in public, that's what we're supposed to do. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah, it's a tough time, you know. I mean, I I'm on staff with crew, and one of the main things we do is share the gospel with college students and high school students and anybody really. But we're focused on the younger generation because they ought to have an opportunity like we did. You know, even me growing up in a Buddhist family and um, being from Hilo, you know, and the kind of person I am. I got a chance eventually, <laughs> not, not 
where I should have, maybe in high school or college. And that's why I do what I do. Um, but there's a way to frame it because there's a lot of arguments against what you and I believe. And I, I'm just assuming that you and I all believe the same thing because we're here at worship. But sometimes people just came here because they go to church on Sunday, you know, and they're just here. Or online, they're watching because, you know, Sunday, we got to get some spiritual input. I'm like, okay. Um, but the word apologetics comes from a Greek word. It's in the New Testament, apologia. And basically means to defend your faith. So, and not just defend, because some people think, oh, I'll just apologize for my faith. No, that's not what it means. <laughs> it means defend your faith. And also, and like, you know, people like Alvin who played football, and I know, you know, some of us here, uh, like Kaleo and stuff, you guys play football. If you just play defense all game long, you're not going to win. You know, it's, it's the defense should be an offense. You should be going out, reaching out with the power of the Lord and his word. And I wrote this actually to speak to a group of non-Christians because I deal with a lot of non-Christian students. Um, and so I'm going to kind of adapt it or modify it on the fly. This is my apologetics class project on one of the topics. And the topic is the, the, the fact that Jesus said that he's the only way to heaven. He's the only way to eternal life. He either he claimed that, and he either like C.S. Lewis said, he's a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And we actually added another one, legend. You know that they made up this legend, and I don't believe that's true. I believe that he is Lord, and this is real. And so I'm going to talk about. I want to start off by praying first, if you don't mind, because I don't have any real good. I can say lots of, you know, dumb stuff up here, but I want to say things that will be powerful for you and for, for the purposes of God. So in order to do that, I need to ask God to help, not help, actually, but take over. God, I just pray, like my brother Ron says, that we would recognize that you are our God and we are your people. And that in that relationship, we have a kuleana to understand who you are who we are, and why you have made, and even how you have made this way that we can be forgiven of our sins, not by our own efforts, by, but actually by, all by you, and that this should shape us. And I pray that th that will this morning, your, your word will, um, you will through the things that you've taught me. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start with a story. A man was in what some of us in Hawaii might call in, in the mainland, they call it, he's in a pickle. You know, in Hawaii, we, we say, the brother was in some deep kimchi, you know what I mean? And uh, he was um, on a highway someplace in the mainland, and he was just driving frantically. I mean, he wasn't driving crazy, but he was driving frantically. Uh, because he, from, from the islands, he was outside a small town in Idaho. I'll just choose one. <laughs> it doesn't say. But, and he was in, he was, like I said, in deep kimchi. He, earlier in the day, he was on a hike by himself, and he got bitten by a snake. I mean, I hardly ever even seen a snake except on TV, National Geographic or something. But, you know, I, he got bitten by a poisonous. And this, the venom of this snake would kill him in a certain amount of hours. So... He needed to get to a specific, what is it, urgent care, they call it, right, unit, to get this antitoxin, uh, antidote for the venom that was in him. So he, he had talked to a few people back a few miles, of some of the locals, and, you know, they said different things. One of them said, you know, when you get to that first turn, just turn off and keep going. Actually, he said, you know, when you get to that next turn off, then you need to turn right. No, I, do, I know I do horrible accents. That's why I do it, because I think it's funny. But the next person he talked to said, definitely don't take the first turn off. You got to go to the third one, and then you go around this place, and then you get onto this other ramp. And then the, the fourth one told him, nah, just do whatever, find a road and go, and you're going to find it. <laughs> um, we're all on this highway of life. And every one of us are running out of time because 
And I'm not just talking about us here, because you might know what I'm talking about, but a, a lot of your loved ones, friends, family, people you work with, we have this venom in us from a poisonous snake, don't we? Yeah? It's called sin. And we're running out of time. So what is the answer to that? And I would share with someone who's not here, I would say it's faith. The answer to this toxin that we have of sin. In particular, faith in the creator God, the only creator God who has a son. And that son is the answer to our quest for healing and life, for survival. A life that's going to last forever, it's filled with hope. Meaning, joy or eventual joy if you're in a place of turmoil. You know, I think you can actually have joy in the face of turmoil because I've been there. It doesn't look like, yeah, you know, hallelujah. But it's, it's like I still have hope. I still believe. I can still smile that I'm still alive and I'm here. And eventually we'll all have this peace. The Bible says that passes all understanding. We can't imagine what that's going to be like. And someone who's here, like if you talk to your friend about this, they might say, oh, you're talking about religion. Right? And you're going to say, no, it's about a relationship. And they don't understand that. So we're going to talk about some of the things that people might talk, tell you when you, you know, God, I think, left these empty spaces to remind us all that we're supposed to fill them up. Because these are all empty spots on the lifeboat. And it'd be really sad if it wasn't filled to the brim when Jesus comes to, to rescue us. Wouldn't it be sad? I think it'd be sad. And it's not that you can fill them by forcing somebody or paying somebody to sit in the seats. You probably could, but that's not what it's about. You know, it's about answering, and that's what apologetics is about, answering the questions that the world has about our faith. The first one that a lot of people will ask you about is number one is that all religions they're going to say all religions are basically are valid and basically teach the same thing they're all same they're all the same they're all on different path to the same god have you guys ever anybody ever heard that one yeah right my own brother told me that i uh, i want to say this i want to share with you guys some of my personal experience uh, i once worked with a student so this is the to answering the question all religions are valid, right? And you might even think that here, so I'm not assuming that. You might think, yeah, yeah, I just happen to choose HMC, you know, because, I don't know, I like it. You know, this is where, this is where my family goes. Um, but I'm going to share some stories that hopefully will help you see something, something different. I once worked with a student right here at the University of Hawaii. He was part of a religious group before he got involved in ours. Their religious group sacrificed animals at their service and tortured people. I'm not going to tell you the other thing he said um, because I don't want to be graphic or anything, but all religions are valid. That's what some people say, right? So this religion that he was in, he would say is not valid. He would say it was bad, like it was hurtful, it was evil. Uh, I once also lived on Oahu. I met a guy at our, in our home church who was supposed to go to a compound in Waco, Texas. You ever heard of Waco, Texas before? He was going to go to be a part of the Branch Davidians there, a, a group, a religious group. This group approved of sexual abuse and firearms violations under their leader. In the practice of their faith. Right? All face are valid, you know. Okay. This led to an eventual raid on their compound by federal agents in which four of those agents, those federal agents, were killed. Seventy-six Branch Davidians at the compound. Many of them, children, died in the fire that erupted after the siege and explosions. I had met my, my friend because he didn't go, luckily, Right? Oh, all religions are valid. Because of this and a lot of other examples, I would say to that, I disagree that all religions are valid. 
In fact, I think some spiritual roads lead to destruction, bad places. And then the people will say, well, all religions teach the same thing, basically, right? I come from a Buddhist family background. And you know that Buddhism doesn't actually teach about belief in any kind of deity or God. Yeah. I didn't know that because the, you know, the bonsan that would do the services, he didn't speak English very much or very well. But, you know, I found that out later through my own study. And Daniel Kikawa helped me. Um, on the opposite end of that religion is the Church of Latter-day Saints or the Mormons who believe that you can become God yourself. God of your own planet. And my brother, who's a, he was once a um, bishop, confessed that to me. In my study of all the world's major religions, I've also learned that the religion of Islam claims to be the only way to heaven. And there's much more that they believe. Um, and you, can, you probably know some of them. Um, I also need to point out that, you know, biblical Christianity, which is, I think what, that's what I believe. I read the Bible chronologically, you know, every year. I've been, I'm not bragging about this. I'm just saying that, to me, this is the only way to know what the Bible really says is to read it. So and, and I get sloppy. I read all over the place. The favorite passages, I read them over and over. The ones that I don't really like, like Numbers or Deuteronomy or something. I, oh, I think I skip that till next time. Song of Solomon, you know. I, I'm not really into that stuff, you know. <laughs> so I have to read it chronologically. So I read the whole thing. But the, the message of Christianity is not about living a good moral life. Did you know that? That is the outcome of what we believe. The thing that biblical Christianity teaches is that we need to have faith in God and through his son, Jesus, and that when he does give us the path to eternal life, give us the way to eternal life, that promise and that hope shapes us, and the output of that is a good moral life. But in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of the world, what is that? Please read your Bible. You'll find out, right? The second thing that you might encounter is that people might say each religion sees part of the truth, but none of them see the whole truth. Now, I'm going to, this is kind of a quirky phrase, but we're going to address the elephant in the room. Right? You guys heard the story, right? Have you heard this one where... Some people say, you know, like, there's an elephant, right? There's, there's five blind men, and they're all touching different parts of the elephant. And so one says, you know, he's touching the trunk. He's a blind man, right? He says, oh, the, the elephant is like a snake. Now the guy's touching the side of the elephant. No, no. The elephant is, is like a wall. And the other one is touching a, the, the you know, tusk. And he goes, no, no. An elephant is like a pointed spear. Um. And you might say, oh, well, you have a point there. You know, I guess all religions do see only part of the truth. And I would say, wait, that story has an incongruency to it. It's, it's self-refuting. You know why? Can anybody tell me? It's because the person telling the story sees the whole elephant. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Well, how do we know that, though? You, you talk to an elephant before. Hey, you remember my name? See, hey, when you take an apologetics course, you learn to ask questions. So that's why I would ask a question. Well, what about the story then? Who's telling the story? All wise person. Or like, I know that all wise person. His name is Almighty God, Jehovah, Elohim, Jesus, the Christ. Because basically in Christianity, we claim we talk to the elephant and he talks to us. We have the Bible. The Bible tells us who God is. His plan for us, right? And so I would say, hmm, there's something wrong about that story. Uh, however, I can tell you how to make it right is get to know the one who sees the whole elephant, and that is Jesus, my Lord. He wrote a book. We can read it. The third thing people might say to you is that we, or me, 
I only believe what I believe because of my culture, culture or history. If you were born in a different place, you're of a different ethnic background, you wouldn't believe in Jesus. It's just that you happen to be born in the United States, and there's Christianity all over the place, references to it all over the place. Well, then how come there's people in India that believe in Jesus? Well, they had missionaries force it down their throat. I'm like, really? Well, how come I was born in a Buddhist family in Hilo, which you might call the United States, but, you know, I talk to Hawaiians who would say otherwise. And, you know, so I didn't come to faith because of my ethnic background or even where I was born, born in Hilo. You know, Hilo is not the mecca of Christianity. I don't know. Maybe you think so. I don't know. It doesn't seem that way to me. But that's kind of my personal refute of that. Um, so basically, I mean, you can go, you can say, well, to an atheist, you can say, well, what if you were born in India? Would you be Hindu then? And they might say, yeah. Like, really? But you said you're an atheist. Hinduism means you actually believe in what the Hindus teach. Or if you were born in the Middle East, you'd be a Muslim, wouldn't you? And sometimes it kind of, you know, the, the main thing about apologetics or answering questions to your faith is just to answer, ask a question. I know a guy named Randy Newman, not the singer of the Toy Story song. This is a different Randy Newman. Uh, <laughs> you guys don't even know what I'm talking about, but, you know. You got a friend in me. You know, that, that's not the Randy Newman I'm talking about. Um, this guy is a... Uh, He's a Messianic Jew. In other words, he was born in a Jewish background, and he came to faith through crew on college campus. And then he decided to explore the connection between his faith in Jesus and the belief in the most of the Jew Jewish, well, almost all the, Jew all the Jewish com community that Jesus was not the Messiah. And he wanted to figure out how to help people understand who Jesus was. And he wrote a book called... Um, Questioning evangelism. And in it, he talks about how Jewish people always ask you questions. Like he said, his uncle asks, um, well, his aunt asks his uncle, How's the weather like in Florida? And the uncle says, What's the weather supposed to be like in Florida in the summertime? He answers with a question. Jesus, if you read your Bible and look, a lot of times he answers a question with a question. It's the way that that ethnic community, it's kind of their tradition. You ask questions, and that is what apologetics is all about. You're just trying to help people understand what the outcome of their belief is. If you don't believe it, that God made human beings, that, that we made him, like we made something up about this God so we could explain stuff, then... It, then we can make stuff up about other things. Like, you know, you can kill young people, really young people. They don't know. You know, they're not even talking that. They don't understand what you're saying. They're not used, they're not worth. You know, they're maybe disabled or something, or they're deformed, you know. So we can get rid of them. That's, that's okay. But if you believe that God created them, then it's different. Right? These are the outcomes. If you believe that there's no God... And, well, why, you know, if I cheat a little bit on this test, it's not a big, you know, I'm going to get ahead. There's no God, you know. I'm just trying to make more money so I can help my family and get the stuff I want, right? These things have consequences. If I die, you know, and I'm in, you know, I'm kind of depressed because um, I'm in a lot of problems right now. And, you know, if I, if I die, there's no God, so eh, I'm just going to become dirt, food for worms. And I'm not going to even feel it because I'm dead. There's nothing else. Consequences. Oh, you know, the people of a certain faith, they are a pariah on the society. So what we're going to do is we're going to herd them up in camps. And we're going to do experiments to help out the human race. You know, there's no God, right? So just, we just, you guys heard that before, right? It's called the Holocaust, you know, where they killed 6 million Jews in gas chambers and tortured them and did experiments on them. You know, ideas have consequences. And if you don't question where those ideas lead to, 
down a deadly road. And, and you don't have to condemn people. You just ask them, so if you believe that, then what about this situation? You know, you cheat on your wife. No God, so nobody sees, right? It's okay, right? No, and they'll have answers to it. You know, no, I'm a moral person. And then you ask, how come? Why do you have an essence or a belief in what is right and wrong? And it'd be interesting for me to hear. I've, I haven't really asked that particular question. But I want to now. So I might be asking you or somebody out there. Where do you get your, the basis of your belief? And what does that end up to? That's basically what apologetics is. And then the fourth point, a fourth thing that people might ask you or they might say is they might say, you know, it's very arrogant of you to say that your truth is the only way and try to convert others to that belief. Very arrogant. There's a famous magician and atheist named Penn Gillette. Have you heard of him? He was very popular, I think, like 20 years ago. I'm pretty sure he still does magic acts. He was part of a pen teller, they were called. They did a lot of shows in Las Vegas and things like that. Anyway, he's a, he's a well-known, outspoken atheist. And in one of his performances, a person came up to him and gave him a New Testament Bible after his performance with uh, writing inside. And he really wanted to help. Pendulet come to know Christ. You would think as an atheist, he would be really ticked off and threw the Bible in a guy's face, but he didn't do that. You know what he said about it? There was a short video he put on the internet, and he said, Penn, Penn Teller says this. He's an outspoken atheist who speaks at atheism conferences. He says this, I don't respect people who don't proselytize, try to convert others to the Christian faith. I don't respect that at all, he says. If you believe there is a heaven and hell and people are going there to, to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's really not, it's not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? And then... Pendulet continues, this guy who gave him the Bible was a really good guy. He was polite, honest, and sane. And he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a Bible. Are we decent and nice and good enough to do that? Or something. Invite him to come to church. Maybe have a special event that Sunday. Maybe there's something fun happening or a movie to watch. Just invite People like to be invited. Some of them will tell you no. But maybe they're not going to say, you know, I really hate it when people invite me to stuff. Most people are not going to do that, especially if you do it nicely. Oh, I can come take you. We go over there afterwards. We can go get coffee or ice cream or something, right? <laughs> so um, in response to that, I'm going to share... A, a few things that we should all know and we should explain to people that we're sharing with, especially when they, they express a desire to know Jesus. You might want to give them a few warnings first. Yep, that's what I said, a few warnings. Because I think uh, in our culture, we're kind of inundated with uh, or kind of in this mode of easy believerism, they call it. In other words, oh, you just got to, you know, pray to receive Jesus and then you're saved and then you start to act like you're saved and everything's fine. You know, <laughs> that is not the gospel, folks, you know. So I, I just put together four. You can make up your own. You can maybe make up 20 of them. But these are the ones that I, that I came up with that people should know before they come to faith. Following Jesus is not convenient. You know, one of the main reasons that I found out in doing this apologetics class, it was, it was a tough, it was eight hours a day. We listened to lectures and read books and wrote papers and notes. This is one of my papers, actually. That people who don't believe in Jesus or don't believe in God, you know why they, they do that? Because it's convenient. 
I once uh, listened to this guy who, who went to college campuses and he shared, he's an apologist. He shares about why to believe in Jesus and stuff like that. You know, and he's a scientist background and stuff like that. Anyway, he said he was witnessing to this guy uh, from, he was like the anthropology professor, like chancellor at Yale or something, one of the big schools, the Ivy League schools. And he was meeting with this guy for several years. And the guy kept telling him, you know, he, he'd run, this guy, Ron Carlson, he'd, he'd come up with a good argument and the guy would be, yeah, but, you know, and then he wouldn't say anything more and then they would go have some fun because they were friends, you know. But he kept meeting with him until finally this this professor said, you know, Ron, I, I believe what you're telling me is true. And Ron was like, whoa, cool. You know, like, now this guy's going to believe, right? He said, no, I don't believe. He's like, why? Why won't you choose to believe in Jesus? You know it's true. He goes, yeah, but if I believe that's true, then I got to stop doing some things that I like doing. And I'm going to have to start doing things that I've never done before. And I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to believe. A lot of times people believe because you know, in, in not believing in Jesus because it's convenient not to believe. You can do whatever you want. If you're an atheist, that's not true, you know, just to let you know that atheists don't just do that just because they can do anything they want. They, a lot of them have form, um, they have ethical and moral beliefs. But I just ask, where, does do, where do those beliefs come from? And can you always stick to them if you don't have a a belief system that's based on something outside of yourself. Because then everything is about me. And then it's about convenience. Right? So I would tell a person who wants to know Jesus, you know, it's, this is not going to be convenient for you. It's going to be tough sometimes. You're going to be some bald-headed Japanese guy telling you to go talk to people about, about me. Right? <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Um, and that's not comfortable. Like Penn... Penn says, you know, but it's the good thing to do if you really believe what we believe. Right? Amen. Right. One amen. That's pretty good. So like I'm talking churches, it was like, can we get the next speaker on? Okay. The second thing, second warning, following Jesus will challenge you to really live out what you believe. Are you challenged today? This is really living, this is being challenged to really live out what you believe. If, if all of us believed, I don't think this church would be packed. It could be. I think that all of us would be talking to people who don't know Jesus and just asking them questions and letting them talk. That's it. First of all, we would be talking to, I, I say, talk to God about people and then talk to people about God. And the way you do that is ask questions or you ask for, for God. He already knows all the answers, but he needs, you know, he could give it to us. Like, how do I talk to this person? God, can you make an opportunity? Can you bring things to my mind that will help me talk to this person that's really, you know, hard to talk to about Jesus? Because I love this person, and I want them to know Jesus. I want, them, I want to see them after this life is over. I want them to get heaven. God, please help me. And then you go talk to the person. So how come you really, you know, what, what's the, maybe they already told you, but how come, you're so hard against this. And just listen. Don't criticize, you know, right? But that's what living out your faith means is just helping others, being a part of making a difference wherever you can. Doesn't mean that they're going to come to Christ all the time. It's up to God, not up to me. The third thing is that following Jesus is going to build your self-image in ways that you never imagined. And then you'd be like, well, of course they want to hear that. Well, it's true. But again, it's not easy. In order to believe in a way that builds your self-image, you have to believe that God really loves you. Even though I did some really messed up stuff in my life. Even though even today, sometimes I don't do everything that I should do. And sometimes I do things that I shouldn't do. But God still loves me. And it's on that basis that I have my self-worth. Not on what people think, you know. Maybe my boss didn't like what I did. Maybe the project I turned in has an F on it. Whatever. It, that's not my worth. That's just a grade. That's just what the person's opinion is. My worth is based on what God thinks of me. And he thinks enough of me to send Jesus 
his only son to die for me. We focus on that. It's going to build your self-image in ways you never imagined. You might even be standing up here preaching one day. You know, I don't know. Maybe that's not your calling. I'm not saying everybody's called to preach. So I would say that getting your identity from our culture nowadays and being a, you know, fluid in your identity, not letting God say who you are, but instead I'm going to make up my own identity, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. I don't have to be graphic about that. Is going to run into problems, which is we're already seeing. But if you choose to know the real God, the one who the Bible claims created you and made you for a purpose and loves you so much that he's going to come alongside you with his power from his spirit and help you become that person, I think that is the, a better plan. And that would be my argument, you know. God has a plan for you. It's not just random. You don't just hang on for the rest of your life and then die and go to heaven. That's not what it's about. God has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. He has a way to help you experience the abundant life that he talks about in John 10.10. 10. Came, he says, the devil, the Satan, comes to destroy you and steal from you. I came that you would have the most awesome life, abundant life, ever. But you need to figure out how that works. And then you need to read what he says about it in the Bible. And pray and then start doing the things that you read. So people get to choose. And then, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to share the the gospel. Um, but I, can I say this one thing before we get to the next part? And this could be the last part. Sorry I'm going long. You know, this is like nine page. I actually wrote this. I had to write the whole thing out word for word, which I hardly, I haven't done this in like, you know, 15 years in preaching. <laughs> so it got really long. <laughs> and, and it was like, again, it was made for non-Christians. So I'm talking to most of you have probably believe, you know, so um, but I wanted to say that we don't have as much time as we think we have all the time. You know, uh, they didn't leave the bike on this Kinoli streets down here, right? I was working with this kid. He's from the mainland. And uh, he's, he's an interesting kid, <laughs> to say the least. That would be a mild way to put it. But anyway, I love this kid. His name is Brody. And um, he's only about 20 years old. I still have a picture of him at one of our campus tabling things that we do at UH Hilo. And he's sitting with my guitar and playing because he like playing guitar, he like surfing. So he'd come to a lot of things that we did because we do stuff like go spear fishing, do fun stuff. And then we would talk about the word of God and talk about the gospel and talk about who Jesus is and stuff. Anyway, um, when, one day I was in Oahu and I get a call from one of my students here who's one of his housemates. And he goes, uh, can't, I gotta, I, sorry to bother you. I know you're on an important thing, you're going to be speaking on Oahu. He says, but i got to tell you that um, Brody's dead. I'm like, wait, this kid's he's only like 20 or 21, you know. I'm like, well, what happened? Well, he was riding his bicycle home from a friend's house early in the morning, and a drunk driver came and took him out, and, and he's gone. You know, we all think we have lots of time. We don't know. Sorry to tell us, because <laughs> I wish we had lots of time. So I think if you want to share the gospel in an easy way, you just, the, you know, like the guy in the story that I shared at the beginning, you, you, you notice um, he cannot find his way on his own, right? He needs help from people. What he really needs is somebody who can see the whole map, Right? Maybe we can Google. How come he never uses his Google Maps? Well, maybe out in the country in Idaho, they don't have that stuff, you know, internet service out there. You know, but right? So we have to know the, the one who knows the whole thing. And if you ask me, I would say God sees the whole picture. And then, of course, the second thing is, uh, so we need to come to the one who knows the way to heaven. Right? And then... We need to come to the one who can give us the antidote, right? That's what this guy's trying to get to, and, and that is God. 
Romans 3.23. I don't, sorry, you know, I forgot to bring my Bible. Isn't that horrible? I can look it up on my phone, but it's going to take time, and I'm already going over time. So I'm going to have you guys, if you want to take notes, you can write Romans 3.23 and 6.23. So we need to admit, confess that we do have sin, and it's going to eventually kill us if we don't get the antidote, kill us permanently. That means being in an eternal state of death. It's a place that people like to talk about called hell. And the Bible talks about it, so I'm going to talk about it. That's it. You know, that's all you need to know. It's a, it's a place of eternal death. Jesus in, in John 14, 6, which is what we you know, got there from, claiming he's the only way, also says he's the way and the life. Now, if Jesus is in heaven and he's not in hell, guess what hell's like? If heaven is about eternal life, then hell would be about eternal death. That's the way I look at it, and that's, that's what I get. And so you can talk to me about it if you don't agree with that, but that's what I understand. So that antidote is in the form of his son, Jesus. Romans 5, 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 6, and of course, John 14, 6, right? And then finally, we need to admit that I need the antidote. You know, this, I think this last thing, you know, we went through this, well, we're still going through it, right? Pandemic, the antidote. Should have been optional. You shouldn't be like coerced into doing it or mandated. But you're ever, I'm not going to get into politics. You know, all I'm saying is you get to choose. This is not mandated. C.S. Lewis says uh, God doesn't, he's a great apologist writer, right, from the past. He says God doesn't send anybody to hell, basically. This is not, this is not an exact quote. He lets them have what they choose. They don't want to know Jesus. They're going to the place where Jesus is not, and that's hell. You can go there. You can choose that. But you need to choose to make a personal decision about Jesus. One last story. I know I'm way over time now. Um, back when I was in college age, this is, you know, like back when Fred Flintstone was still cruising around in his, no, this is a long time ago. I bought the first vehicle I ever bought with my own money. It was a truck. It wasn't just any old truck. It was a lifted four-wheel drive truck. My wife calls it my mock mobile, you know. I was a mock brother, you know. The sunglasses, I had hair back then, you know. And I was, yeah, that's right. I was skinny. Um, and I had this truck. It was lifted, had big tire, deep rims, you know, fuel injection. On the first, first adventure we took my baby on, my friend and I went to this place. We were going to meet some friends at a place called Smoking Rock. You know where that is, Kaleo? Smoking Rock. You know why they call it Smoking Rock? Because when the water come up, it hits the bottom. It doesn't come over the rock. So you can fish from it. You can catch big ulua, big fish, right? But when the wave hit, it's, it, it tosses all the spray up in the air and makes it look like the rock is smoking. So anyway, we're, we're going to go Smoking Rock. So we, we, you know, heard from people, you know, where where the place was and stuff and how to get down there. So we go, road to the sea, and we get down there. Six hours we drove. We're, after we got there, and this is in South Point, the past South, South Kona. Six hours. I'm, I'm looking at my friend like, hey, we're going to run out of gas pretty soon, bro. <laughs> this thing get fuel injection, you know, and we, he goes, no, no worry, no worry. You get brand new tires. <laughs> so, so we go, in, uh, six hours we drive, and finally he goes, you know what, I remember... What our friends said, and they've been there before. They said to go down there. And in, in about 30 minutes, we, we found a spot after going six hours. We had to find someone who'd actually been there. And this is what I want to share with you. Jesus claims in the Bible that he's actually been there where we want to go. And that's why I follow him. Because I know what it's like to be lost and running out of fuel and running out of time. And Jesus knows where the place is for me to get the antidote and to get my life tank filled up again. Um, and so I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to do one more song and wrap it. All right. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray over all of us that you'd give us an opportunity to help people know the only one who knows and can get us there to the place we want to go. Please help us do that, Lord. And help us just be a part of that. Wh whatever we do, whether we just pray for people 
and then ask them questions and just listen. But we actually get to share how they can follow you too. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Daniel, if you're listening, I, I promise I'm not going to write one manuscript out again. It won't take this long. <laughs> I'm just going to write the notes and ramble like I do. Let's, let's worship God. Come, now is the time to worship. as you are to worship come just as you are before your God come one day one day every tongue will confess you are God one day every knee will bow still the greatest treasure remains let me choose you now Sing that again, one day One day every tongue will confess you are God One day every knee will bow Still the greatest treasure remains for those Who gladly choose you now Now is the time Just as you are for your God, come, come, worship, come, worship Jesus. All right, God bless your week. Thanks for being here. Hallelujah. God is good, right? Amen. Amen.